Today we're going to look at the notion of something called a ring as well as some behaviors that can occur inside rings that don't occur in everyday arithmetical structures. So let's quickly look at the definition of a ring. So it's a set together with two operations, which we generally call addition and multiplication, satisfying some axioms. So we've got an element called zero, so that when we add anything from the ring to zero, you get whatever you started with. So that's like an additive identity. If you've got an element r in the ring, then something that we'll call negative r is also inside the ring. The important thing here is that if you add these two together, you get zero. That means everything has an additive inverse. Then addition is both commutative and associative. The multiplication is associative, but not necessarily commutative. And finally, you've got these distributive rules. You need two of them because you don't necessarily have commutativity of multiplication. So A multiplied onto B plus C is the same thing as A, B plus A, C, and then similarly for a right distributive rule. Now, what are some examples? Well, there are a bunch of standard examples that you know, we'll list right now. And then after listing these standard examples, we'll look at some weird behaviors that can occur inside of rings. So let's notice the real numbers, the rational numbers, and the integers are all standard examples. In fact, we knew all of these things about the real numbers, the rational numbers, and the integers way before we knew what a ring was. You learn things like the additive identity and additive inverses way back in like elementary school. And then there are some other things like z cross z. So that's going to be all ordered pairs with entries from integers. And here the operation can happen component wise. Then you could also have n by n matrices with entries pretty much anywhere you want. But let's put the entries inside of the real numbers. And so this is going to be a ring, but the multiplication is not commutative here. It's pretty easy to find matrices that do not commute when we multiply them. Let's look at maybe 1, 1, 0, 1 times 1, 0, 1, 1. And what you'll notice, multiplying those out, you get different answers depending on the order of multiplication. I'll let you check that, but that is an example of matrices not commuting. Next, you could have continuous functions from R to R. You could really have like any function or even differentiable functions where your multiplication is simply multiplying the two functions. Then you could have maybe a classic example from an abstract algebra type class, which would be Zn. And we could take this to be like the numbers 0 to n minus 1, where your addition and your multiplication are defined so that you do normal addition and multiplication, and then you divide by n and keep the remainder. So what that amounts to is the following types of calculations. So inside of z7, 5 plus 6 would be equal to 4. So that seems crazy, crazy but 5 plus 6 is 11. But inside of z7, 11 is equal to 4. That's because if you divide 11 by 7, you get a remainder of 4. And then similarly, 4 times 4 is equal to 9 inside of z7. That's because 16, which is 4 times 4, is equal to 9 in z7. If you divide 16 by 7, you get a remainder of 9. Okay, so now that we've reviewed something about rings, Let's maybe go ahead and look at some weirdness that can occur. So to explore the certain type of weirdness inside an arbitrary ring, we need a definition of something called a zero divisor. So given a ring R, we say that elements A and B are zero divisors if A is not equal to zero, B is not equal to zero, but A times B is equal to zero. So let's notice in the integers or the rational numbers or the real numbers, there are no zero divisors. So you use this all the time to solve equations over the real numbers. For instance, if you take x squared minus x minus 6 equals zero, 
you would generally factor this as something like x minus 3 times x plus 2 equals 0. And then in order to solve this, you would say, oh, well, I know that either x minus 3 equals 0 or x plus 2 equals 0. But if you're in a land of zero divisors, then you can't make this leap right here with this red arrow. That's because you're not guaranteed to have a product of two things equaling zero tell you that one of those is equal to zero. Of course, it works in R, Q, or Z, but not in a general ring. And now let's look at some examples of zero divisors. So maybe one classic example would be z cross z and things that are similar. So you could have like q cross q, r cross r, maybe z cross q, things like that. It's easy to find zero divisors here because the multiplication is component wise. So let's notice something like 3 comma 0 times 0 comma 17 is 0 comma 0. Again, because the multiplication is component wise. You get 3 times 0 and 0 times 17. And this tells us that these two things that I'm underlining in magenta are indeed zero divisors. That's because they are not zero, but their product is zero. Now let's move on to matrices. And likely you've seen examples of matrices that do this in a linear algebra class. If you've taken a linear algebra class, but maybe you didn't use the word zero divisor. So let's look at an example. So let's take one, two, two, four, so that matrix right there, and let's multiply it into the matrix, negative two, one, negative two, one. Okay, and so let's do our standard trick for multiplying matrices, or the standard rule. You might say, well, actually, why do we multiply matrices like that? Well, I in fact made a whole video that motivates the way we multiply matrices. That should be up in the card right now and also at the end of the video if you'd like to check it out. I think it's a really good explainer video for that kind of stuff. Okay, so anyway, we're gonna swivel this first row into the, this first column and notice that we get negative two plus two, which is zero. We're gonna do that the same thing for this entry and we'll get zero. We'll do that for this entry here, notice that Two, four swivels into this, giving us negative four plus four, and likewise for this other one, we get zero and zero. But check it out, we've got two things that are not zero, but their product is zero. Now, inside matrices, you can find tons of examples. Like, for example, we could look inside of the matrix or the three by three matrices with real entries at something like this. What if we have 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0? And you might say, well, that's only one matrix. We need something else to you know, make it into a zero divisor. But in fact, this is a special type of matrix called a nilpotent matrix. And if you cube this thing, you in fact get the zero matrix. So I'll let you check that by doing matrix multiplication, but that's a special type of zero divisor where you just have to multiply it by some power of itself to get to zero. Okay, let's look at a couple more examples. Now we're gonna look at two more examples, but before we do that, if you've gotten this far into the video and you like this abstract algebra stuff, well, in fact, I have a full course on abstract algebra on my second channel, Math Major. And furthermore, that course has zero ads. In fact, the whole channel is ad-free. And you might say, Michael, how do you do that? Well, I do it with help from the patrons. So the support that I get on Patreon helps me keep that channel ad-free, thus reducing any of the friction that you might have to the learning process over there. Okay, so now back to the examples. So let's find a zero divisor or zero divisor pair inside of the ring of continuous functions. And I particularly like this example. Let's take this first function f of x to be defined in a piecewise way. Let's say it's x if x is bigger than or equal to zero, and it's zero if x is less than or equal to zero. I'm able to write it with overlap there because at zero it's continuous. These are always continuous functions. That's our setting here. 
and then we'll take g of x to be equal to zero when x is bigger than or equal to zero, and x if x is less than or equal to zero. And now let's graph this to convince ourselves that if we take the product, we indeed get zero. Okay, so let's maybe graph f of x in this magenta color. So when x is less than or equal to zero, this thing is equal to zero, so that means we're along the x-axis. And then it's equal to x, so we're along maybe like one of our favorite graphs, that function right there. Okay, so there's the graph of f of x. Now let's graph g of x maybe in this blue color. Okay, so let's see. When x is bigger than or equal to zero, it's equal to zero. When it's less than or equal to zero, it's equal to x. So maybe that's best drawn like this. So this would be the less than or equal to zero portion, and this would be the greater than or equal to zero portion. But maybe the important thing here is, regardless of what real number you're at, when you multiply these two functions, you'll always get zero. So for instance, if you pick this value of x, notice the magenta function is zero, but the blue function is non-zero, but you take that product and you get zero. Versus when you take this value of x, the blue function is zero, but the magenta function is non-zero. Well, you take their product and you get zero. So that tells us that for all x in R, we have f of x times g of x equals zero. But what that tells us is that f times g is equal to the zero function. But that product is a zero function, whereas neither of them are the zero function on their own. Okay, so for our last example, we're gonna look at z mod n, where n is composite. We'll do this by example. So for example, let's look inside of z36, and let's notice that for that nine times 12, well, that's equal to 108, but 108 is the same thing as three times 36, which is equal to zero. So we've done it. We have nine, which is non-zero, 12, which is non-zero, but they multiply together to be zero. That means nine and 12 are zero divisors. Now, of course, we've got a bunch more as well. Notice that six times itself is 36, which is equal to zero. That means six is also a zero divisor. Let's also notice that there is some other weirdness that occurs in here as well. Notice that 9 squared is equal to 81, but 81 is the same thing as 9 plus 72. Oh, but 72 is the same thing as 36 times 2, so inside of z36, 9 squared is equal to 9. But that tells us that the equation defined by x squared equals x has at least three solutions. And those solutions are zero and one. So those are our clear solutions. Zero squared is zero and one squared is one. But it's also got this other solution nine. Maybe some more solutions. Post them in the comments if you know. But that really goes against the grain of what we've learned about polynomial equations, that you only have as many solutions as your degree. This is a second degree polynomial equation, so you should only have two solutions. But that rule is totally thrown out in the world of zero divisors. You could have many, many more solutions. In fact, you could construct a crazy ring where you have potentially infinitely many solutions. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this video about some abstract algebra concepts. And if you wanna learn more, like I said, go check out my second channel. So there should be a link on the screen right now to that video about matrix multiplication, as well as the playlist for the abstract algebra course. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, 
subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.